everybody. Uh, this is the Interjections Podcast. I'm Tristan Moore, and we have with us, as usual, Corey Taylor, uh, James Aaron, Hi. and uh, Jeff Sesselberg. Uh, we are always excited to uh, be talking about the 1990s. We're a podcast that uh, has decided to focus on an undiscovered decade. We were pretty young when these movies started coming out, so as we move along, we'll start to recognize more and more, but for now, we're in May 1990. Well, in May 1990, uh, the prequel to my favorite trilogy came out. Everyone's favorite Western, Back to the Future, Part 3. Uh, the one where Marty and Doc actually have an adventure and go outside of a place where none of them knew, were familiar with the area. If you'll remember at the end of Part 2, yeah, we're probably going to go into the whole trilogy a little bit, right? Yeah. Like that compared to I mean, you can't talk about three without talking about what led up to it. Mm -hmm. But two and three were actually shot together, um, both for budgetary concerns and to make sure that <clears throat> everything flowed as smoothly as possible. So at the end of two, DeLorean gets struck by lightning and Doc gets sent back to 1885 and kindly requests that Marty doesn't show up and doesn't come back to save him because he's, he's just living his life as a blacksmith in the 1880s. Uh, to which Marty just, you know, ignores it, totally disobeys. So, yeah, he does it anyway. <laughs> yeah, he's like, whatever, I'm a teenager. I'm going to yeah. go save my friend. Uh, the weird thing is that he's still in 1955. Does he get stuck there? I forget. Because he has to figure out a way either to go home and he chooses to go help him anyway, right? Right. Well, what happened was he went back in, in two because they went back to 1955 to get the book and prevent Donald Trump, I mean, mm -hmm. from becoming president. And so they take the almanac they burn the almanac, and then right at that moment, the time machine gets struck by lightning. So he doesn't have a chance to get back to 1985. So A, he needs to get okay. back to 1985. He's stuck there. So at the end of two and beginning of three, he runs back. And, you know, the, the movie opens with him coming back right after it's sent back the first time. And then mm -hmm. he runs back in, and Doc gets shocked, and passes out because he's like i just tell you back yeah. he's like no i'm back again um that is a clever little thing right just yeah play it is funny like, the next morning when he has to go through all these verbal contortions to tell him how many times he's gone like ricocheted back and forth and time he's just like forget it I, yeah yeah i mean it's it's also preceded by my my favorite moment in the trilogy which is like at the end of two when when it's struck by lightning because like you have a minute where suddenly he's gone and then the car shows up with the letter and 70 years one minute like all, all happened in the same time yeah that was really cool and it, it was i don't know i still got chills Western Express delivers the letter, right? Um, Joe Flaherty? No, no, it's Something like a. Isn't it Joe Flaherty from mean? SCTV? Because like a uh, the guy was like, ah, uh, we uh we have a very very specific instructions to give this to you. <clears throat> wow, so at this exact that. moment. I love I love that they're like, uh, we had a bet going that this wouldn't even happen. <laughs> yeah. So looks like I lost. <laughs> That's the coolest thing. I always like, that's kind of like a trope. I don't know if that was bef ever before this in time travel movies, but like, oh, we, we didn't know this was going to happen. We just kind of sat on it. Like, what if they didn't deliver it? What if it like got, it slipped in the cracks and never got delivered? Yeah. Or like, they just were like, this is dumb. 80 years ago, no one's going to care. So. Yeah. It was. He's really lucky. Yep. <laughs> it would It would have ended up in the dead letter place yeah all the These days who would end up in narnia so uh <laughs> doc chance brown right 
but it um yeah so the reason they go back to 1885 instead of just like because the letter contains instructions to make it to get the time machine working again because it's buried in a mine somewhere so they get that it has instructions to get it working again so that he can get back to 1985 hmm. but when they're going to find the time machine, they also find Doc's tombstone where it's announced that he was shot in the back by some ancestor of Biff. And that is why he goes back. Yeah. Marty, Marty can't stop himself from saving Doc, even though it's like, maybe he was okay with being in the Wild West. You don't know how long he, re well, it says 1885, so he wasn't there that long, I'm guessing. So right. I guess that's why he feels compelled to save his friend because he has the chance to. He just can't stop himself. Yeah. Because he was like, only, because Doc was only killed like, in October of the same year that he was sent back. Yeah. So he just didn't want to he didn't want him to get shot. He's like, you could have died any other way, but it had to be shot in the back. So you know what? I'm going back to, to help you. Um, I really want to see an origin story about like how those two became friends because yeah. it just I don't know. Yeah, it's, why is why is a teenage boy who really only has a girlfriend and no other friends hanging out with his old man who everyone said was like a recluse and lives in his parents' garage of the house that burnt down 30 years earlier that never got rebuilt? Like that's a that's an odd ball situation. Yeah. Like how they even meet. There's so many theories, but the one that I've been going with was that oh, like um, Lord of Men with Candy. He got a Ambler he got a convention. They met. He oh. got a part-time job as a as a lab assistant or something like he it was just in the classifieds. He needed credit, and so he showed up. Oh yeah, it's, it's going to look good on his college papers. Suddenly <laughs> he's trying to fuck his mom. Uh, wow. I felt like Doc worked for a day at an electronics store. Marty went in there to buy a guitar. Hmm. And he's like, you want these specifications? And he's like, oh, you're really good with guitars. Maybe I could show you a demonstration sometime. And then he goes to his house. Yeah, that's a good one. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah. All the fan fiction they could be writing about Back to the Future right now. I know. There probably is fan fiction. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there is. There's comic books and there was the animated series. Well, was there, was a, there was the game. I was going to ask you about that. You played was, that, right? Yeah, it, it's basically Back to the Future 4. Like, it's... I think Zemeckis and Gale gave the script their blessing, so it's like... But that goes back into... <clears throat> you go back into the 20s, and you deal with, like, Strickland's ancestors and things like that. So it's actually... It's it's very well done. Hmm. Um, this is perfect timing to be talking about this movie, too, because they just released the 4K <laughs> of the mm -hmm. trilogy. Yeah, well, it's been 35 years since the first one came out. Yeah, and, and, and we're like, recording this the week of Back to the Future Day when it actually all happens all around October 21st, right? Yeah, that was the day that they showed up in uh, 2015, mm -hmm. which is now the distant past. Yeah, so it was already five years ago Sorry. that uh, it was future, Back to the Future Part 2, Time. yeah i always wanted to see what would happen if they had like i was like to imagine there was like the secret underground group of people that was you know they they saw zemeckis and gail's script as like prophecy and so they kept trying to like do what they could to make sure 2015 in real life matched up with 2015 and in, in the movie <laughs> The thing I always hoped was the uh, the baseball game was the Miami Gators and the Chicago Cubs. And in 2016, the Cubs finally won their first World Series in over like 90 years. And there was a Miami team. They just were in the NL too. 
and famously messed up the Cubs' run in '98, uh, I believe, or no, '03 when they won. So, but yeah, it's yeah. it's close, but no cigar. You know? Yeah. It's funny uh, rewatching this movie. Uh, I actually just watched it the other day just for this podcast because um, I had seen it. It's actually it was my least favorite of the three. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's still kind of my least favorite of the three. A- admittedly, I like all three. I think the first one's the masterpiece, yeah. obviously. But um, uh, watching it again, I was starting to get Lost World vibes because mm-hmm. it starts off with them sleeping. I was like, oh, am I getting lulled into a, a false sense of comfort here? And then everybody's kind of their personalities are heightened to almost caricature in the first scene. Like when he's telling, uh, when he's talking to Doc and Doc's pressing on the piano keys, it all feels very caricatured. Well, that always bothered me too, because he's like, who's Clint Eastwood? Oh, right. You don't know him yet. And there's a picture of like, Clint Eastwood was around. He was a studio player back then. Like he wasn't famous, famous because he had to sure. go Philly still. So he's not like the guy who made Unforgiven. Mm-hmm. You know, well, once it actually gets to the old west, that's where the movie picks up significantly. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, yeah, I do like that he dresses him in the most ridiculous uh, western costume to go back there, and then and then when Marty meets eighteen eighty five Doc, or at least like his original guy, uh, he's like, "Who dressed you?" Oh yeah, I, li- I actually <laughs> liked his performance as the uh, Irish settler, Seamus. Yeah, you yeah, like Seamus. Him? Yeah, Seamus. That was actually something I wanted to ask you guys. I guess we could bring it up now. Um, the whole Crispin Glover question. Now, we know this is why I figured we were going to talk about two a bit anyway. He famously turned down reprising his role for the sequels. And so then we were forced to have like the weird upside down dad just for a scene so that they could kind of hide the makeup. You never really see him when they redo scenes in the 1955 area. And then it was pretty obvious that he probably would have played Seamus. And I think that's a little bit of a detriment for me. I would have loved to see Crispin Glover do some West, old West stuff. And it, it ends up being that, um, what's her name? It's Maggie, his mom playing Maggie. Because, yeah, Lorraine. Yeah. Um, she just doesn't do much in the third film. She has much more to do in the second each one of the movies is about a different character. So the first one's about Marty. The second one's about, <laughs> I forget his girlfriend's name. Um, uh, Elizabeth Shue. Yeah. And then the third one's about Doc. Right. So, um, Lorraine yeah. really never got her own movie in a way. She clearly features in the first two, but I feel like she's given a short shrift because then it's like Michael J. Fox's chance to like do a goofy Irish accent. Well, in the second movie, he plays the daughter as well. <laughs> True. Yeah. So, so they're guess, having yeah. filmed those two back to back is a is a godsend in a way because yeah. then they could complement each other. Yeah. In fact, uh I really like in the third one, there's growth to his character because he could have just stayed in like Chrysalis after a while. They yeah. could have had nothing to do with his character. But when he gets called out for the um when they're gonna have the showdown outside and he just goes, He's an asshole. I don't need to go out there and have a shootout with him. Yeah. Whereas in the other two movies, if he had called him a chicken or a yellow belly, he'd have automatically went out there and had uh, the showdown with him. How do you guys feel about the whole chicken thing? Because I remember as a kid, I felt like it was a little bit shoehorned in and I didn't realize until rewatching when we were doing it for your birthday, they do do it in the first movie just once. Right. So yeah. it's kind of... Yeah. Like, I guess, I guess um, it's good like as like... <laughs> Because, like, in the first movie, they do it once, and, like, you get a sense that, like, you know, he's a brash teenager. He's going to react like a brash teenager would. And then the second movie, uh, it's what actually gets him in trouble throughout his whole life. Yeah, so it's like, it's, it, be, it, it, be, it goes from, like, a typical teenager to a, 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 per, a, like a, a character flaw. Yeah. And then, like, uh, the third movie, tri- like, it's a trilogy. Like, you got to tie up, tie things up, and, like, you have to grow as a person. Yeah. So, like, finally, he grew as a person. He's like, you know what? this whole ego thing that I got going on right now, too much to handle. Cause like it's a, odd whole, because... a whole lot of other things going on and I need to be able to be like a fully developed human being and handle it properly and not react. So like he, uh, he grows. Yeah. So yeah. by the third movie, he doesn't take the bait. 
even though he's kind of put to the sidelines for uh, the Doc Brown and Mary Steenburgen in uh, romance, which yeah. I think is the heart of the movie. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I think it features probably the best climax outside of the first one. Are in you terms of the, because of the train chase? The train chase is great. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It ends it on a Bavara note. I um I did want to actually ask about the Chris McGlover thing. The the reason I brought that all up was um would you feel it would have been better to have Chris McGlover or did it turn out all right in the <clears> end anyway? <throat> I think it did. I think it turned out great. Um, I mean, because at the end of the day, it's 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 a fun movie, um, and I feel like. You know, having Michael J. Fox just play all these different characters, it would, I, 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 for some reason, knowing, it's hard to separate from how I, I know Crispin Glover now, <laughs> to, to think that he wouldn't, ha like, had he done it, I feel like he would have taken Seamus in a much darker way. Agreed, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I don't, I don't even know how, I can't wrap my head around how he would have played it too. interesting point yeah like that's because he was the reason he kind of turned it all down was he didn't like the ending of the first film and how it kind of like <laughs> promoted everything works out in the end if you have the things you wanted like you money yeah, it was car, it was too commercial for him novel yeah right. so he was like anti-capitalist right right or exactly. anti-materialistic more anti-materialistic yeah, that, that, that would be more and uh, so the irony is that like the big deal in two is that marty fucks up because he's got all the material goods he's kind of an asshole and so it's kind of playing on what chris mcglover had told gail and zemeckis mm -hmm. so um he might have been good as a, a put upon irish immigrant who knows yeah I, it's, it's kind of just a what if i like yeah mike's uh mustache so and then years later apparently chris mcglover and zemeckis made amends because he is in uh beowulf oh okay i didn't know that that's true but i think he still has issues with bob gale sure i think it's more gale <laughs> yeah um, I thought the uh, fish out of water references weren't as strong this time around. Oh, like yeah. when uh, when uh, Mad Dog Tannen is shooting at me, he's moonwalking. Mm. Yeah, that's a and, scary. and the taxi driver scene in the mirror. Mm. Really, I didn't even notice that one. What was that? Was that it's when he's one? getting ready for the duel. And he says, "You I'm looking gonna... at me? You looking at me?" Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Just because we watch it back in May, I must have forgotten that little moment. <laughs> so. Interesting. I, well, I, it was, it's 1990, the beginning of this like cultural trend where you just obnoxiously make references to like movies prior. Yeah. Like the like the 90s, a little bit of the, oh, I don't know how bad it was in the 80s, but I know growing up in the 90s, like, holy crap, my whole, my whole wealth of knowledge with, of movies stems from all these references from like television and other. Well, like Tarantino oh, and sorry. Kevin Smith are big on being self-referential. Mm -hmm. So they'll just the they do, do things in pop culture. This may be one of the first ones that does it, and it's not like heavy yet, but this is probably one of the components. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is probably like, hey, trying to like Hollywood notice something's like, hey, people really <laughs> like it when we do this. Let's keep on doing it. So yeah. they kept on doing it. And like, hey, I guess for Johnny be good. Beat the well, devil. Right, Johnny right. be good in the first one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Huey Lewis then, has a cameo. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. The, the um yeah because the moonwalking thing was a little coarse but then they also yeah uh they showed the origin of, of frisbees i like that one i actually like that one yeah and that was around like it was created around then so it makes sense yeah did their research on that one as well as the origin story of zz top uh-huh <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah you uh did you uh, read about how they ended up in the film? Because I, I heard a little bit about it. Uh, um, not the way Aerosmith ended up in Polar Express. Oh, Jesus. Um, apparently, Zemeckis was a big fan of theirs and wanted to do something different from Huey Lewis. And so he got them to do the song. <clears throat> and it happened to be at set. So they kind of, and they were doing the dance anyway. So they're like, why don't we just put you in the background? 
And there was a whole thing where they were like setting up camera still. So ZZ Top started playing mm -hmm. and he like let them go. The camera was ready for a while, but like let them party for a couple hours and just like have an actual dance party on set. So, but they weren't supposed to be in the film. They just happened to come by to like discuss their recording. So, wow. And they're like, well, you're like camera ready. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, just throw an overcoat over you guys, and right. you're already wait. It's like awesome. no makeup. This is just like yeah, no, just go. Oh, those beards, man, they <laughs> cover up everything. <laughs> so, right. Except Frank Beard, the drummer who has no beard. <laughs> <laughs> you have no beard. I lied. You do. Um, I did like that that dance scene. That's that's pretty good. Where you, I think that's the first time we see Strickland's cameo, where he's the sheriff. Yeah. which makes sense for uh, the principal to be the sheriff in town. Um, and that's really where I think the romance comes together for me with, uh, um, what is her name? It's Clara. Clara. So, um, cause she's, she's kind of off put by him at first because they're trying to avoid her because Marty has decided this is why he dies because he stays for Clara. But right. uh I think I think they're very cute on the dance floor, and and uh, Christopher Lloyd is just beaming the whole time. So I, mm. I really believe it in the dance scene. So yeah, I mean, this is you know, it's Doc's story, like it's it's his. They both have arcs, but this one is actually like a love story for Doc because Marty had the last two movies to fuck up his relationship with her. <laughs> Right. Jennifer. Yeah. And Back for some you know, this this time you see Doc in his element because you know he sets himself up as a blacksmith and he like falls in love with a teacher. And it's like and even from the beginning of the movie, like the 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 music when they're asleep at the beginning is very like slow, soft, uh romantic. Um and it was, and then with, with the dance scene and with just everything going on, like it's, it's a love story. It's uh, funny. It's paced in a way where it's like, if you watched all three back to back to back, it's like at that moment, you need kind of like a narrative intermission. So you need the energy because the energy is so high at the end of two, you kind of need that little bit of rest. Yeah. So yeah, when they're taking a nap in the mansion, at the beginning of that, it's like you kind of need that for pacing reasons. Yeah. But uh, where could they go if they did a fourth one, do you think? This is all speculation, but... Um, now, I like what actually happens in the game. So I do like... You said it's the 20s? Yeah, they go back to the 20s at one point. Yeah, and then they go to an alternate future. future. And then I what? Because they, they go back and forth in the game, too. So they go back... To the 20s like they're dealing with prohibition era stuff like that. um and like you you see doc at college um and then you also see at, a, at another point they do like um an alternate timeline thing where doc has become instead of inventing the flux capacitor he he creates basically is is this utopian big brother type <clears throat> Hmm. So, yeah, like he he dedicates all of his energy to like bettering society that way, but it like goes horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's really interesting the way that they go with it. So I feel like that counts as four. But if they did like a separate story, I mean, I would love to see the origin of the time train like just how, back to 1885 yeah because because like because <clears throat> at the end of three there's that big flying train that also has it's got a hover conversion it's got the time machine it's got, like he built this all with 1885 parts allegedly right and then went to the future and then had kids for that are now like 12 like what the heck, like a lot happened in the last two minutes of the movie that we, that was never 
addressed. And I'm like, I would love to see how all that happened. I, I kind of just want to see them go on an adventure. Maybe those kids right. are a little older, so they're actually good actors. But I like Mary Steenburgen and I love Christopher Lloyd. So I would have liked to see like a Doc and Clara adventure somewhere in time. You don't necessarily need Michael J. Fox. And that was actually, I think, the rumor in the 90s that they wanted to do. But obviously that doesn't, like, I'm happy how it is because then it's preserved pretty perfectly. Right. Um, and we get the TV show, which kind of does what I would want. So I should just, I've never watched the animated series. I should just watch that. Yeah. I mean, the, the animated series is, <clears throat> they're all going on adventures. And, you know, it's got Marty, Doc, Clara, the kids, okay. Einstein. They're, they're all flying around doing stuff. So you do get the best of both worlds, huh? Yeah. Everything. You get the best of everything. You, but you still got that slacker Marty just, like, riding Doc's coattails. Oh. Um. I did want to ask about the ending. Uh, well, not ask. I had a, a thing I, I didn't ever think about before, but just reading about the trivia and stuff on IMDb. Um, I never thought about this. The drag race with Needles and Marty at the end, they had the right of way. So the fact that he hits the Rolls Royce, the Rolls Royce pulls into his lane. He is never at fault. The whole thing where he owes money should never have happened. Like that guy's just an asshole. Well, I think it was also the fact that he broke his hand. Mm. Like that was the, the okay. other. Like it might not have ruined him financially, but it ruined his prospects of being a musician, which gotcha. then probably sent him into a deep depression. And, and so he becomes an asshole. Okay, yeah. I never thought of that part either. So, you know, as a kid, I didn't even get what was happening with that whole future thing because I think I saw three first, which confused me even further. Mm. Uh, so I see the ending and I'm like, why is he like not drag racing? Who cares? I don't know. I didn't get the chicken thing when I was a kid. Yeah. <sighs> Much clearer in high school when I finally saw the trilogy in order for the first mm -hmm. time when, I, when we became friends. Yeah, for a movie where they jump around in time, it helps to watch it in order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um one of the things that I love about this movie is like I've always been fascinated with that that sense, especially in time travel movies, when you go like you the scenic foreshadowing where you know that something's supposed to be there, but it's still starting. Like in, in the first movie when he goes back to where his house is supposed to be and it's still under construction. Mm -hmm. You know, and they do the same thing with the, the clock tower and everything in, in this. Movie. Is that what's behind you? Yeah. Look at that. Hey. Under construction. <laughs> I love um, the little details like that. Yeah. And it's, I just appreciate that just as it gives the whole movie a way bigger scope. Um, because the Twin Pines um, Mall as opposed to the Lone Pine Mall. Yeah, I didn't right. realize that until we watched this year. Because he right. crashes in the first movie into one of the trees. Mm -hmm. Just all the, the little things like that. But this is like, it, it starts off, um, you know, the first movie suddenly his house isn't there. And then in the second movie, it's a different timeline. And then all of a sudden you have, there's barely a town right now like it's it's definitely nails in the the wild west aspect like it's deadwood with a clock tower mm -hmm. um and i do like that they never really explain why but like the tannins and mcflies have just been there since 1885 so this really right. is the linchpin year for the town and like they have a few too they're like the hatfields and mccoys yeah, right there. right I'd say it's the hatfields and mccoys yeah and there's got to be something to this time, like the aura around the traveling. What are the chances that Doc Brown meets Marty McFly, one of the ancestors? I mean, they're a big family in town, apparently, but that he has to go help them and the two families are the whole line. So just to help the town work, Doc Brown has to follow the lineage back. You know, like it's, if he meets the wrong kid to help him with his experiments, maybe none of this happens. Maybe they're not as empathetic and want to save him from the terrorists or yeah. whatnot. So yeah, yeah. I mean, to to say nothing of like 
when Doc goes back, you know, who he could have accidentally talked to or something. Like, nothing changes in 1955. <clears throat> so you don't know. Like, I guess he, he didn't fuck up the timeline enough. Um, or he was super when, careful. Or maybe time is a circle. Who knows? I mean, they never bring this up. But they never try to, like, prevent JFK's death or, uh, like... Well, Doc could have invented penicillin, penicillin twenty years earlier or something. Yeah. So. Well, he, well, the whole well, they already established you can't you can't screw with the timeline, right? So he, like he wouldn't do right, that. But but his his being there mm -hmm. is over like and setting up a business. So re already, really, what it is is like he can't screw with his timeline. Yeah. yeah. His existence cannot be compromised. Everybody mm -hmm. else just it's whatever. Yeah. It's honestly a good thing they don't kill Mad Dog Tannen because nothing would happen then. You'd be funny if, if Biff's not there to bully. Well, you, uh, if he's Chris not there to be the coil, right? Yeah, yeah they are yeah. In, intertwined. Like uh, it'd be funny, like uh, or interesting to have a take. Like if you expand on Marty's, like you know, uh, social uh, network, so to speak. When he was growing up, like who are his friends? Like what if what 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 would have happened if like there was like something they screwed up and he just doesn't remember that like uh because he erased them yeah uh, that like Ooh. friend like friends that he had as kids they just don't exist anymore and just like, like he comes back and the Mandela like, effect yeah what if what if he was friends with Biff too before all this happened but him going back in time makes the Tannins bullies yeah. you know or like uh, yeah, yeah what, what if there's like a crap ton of people like uh. In each timeline that he knew, and like they just don't exist anymore, and all all that matters is just like a uh, Doc Brown and him, and like yeah. uh, their extent, like their immediate like uh, uh, loved ones. Yeah, no more Billy Zane. Uh, speaking of Biff and Buford and all the Tannins, can we talk about how good Thomas Wilson is in these? Oh seasons? my God, <laughs> he's a gem. A rugged, Why he wasn't yeah. a bigger actor. After yeah. this, like a Billy Zabka type, yeah, you understand. He should get a, a show like Cobra Kai to like revitalize his career. He's what so if they did it from Biff's point of view, like a like like Back a, to the Future, like Cobra Kai? Yeah, like the um, the yeah. big bad wolf asking for sugar from the three little pigs. Just wanted some sugar. I didn't mean to eat you. <laughs> yeah, that kind of trope. Definitely. That'd be good. yeah, that'd be a good Back to the Future four. Hmm. Biff's, Biff's story. Yeah. Yeah, he could have been a great character actor, but for some reason, I don't know what happened after these Back to the Future movies, but he kind of went on either hiatus or dormancy, and I don't remember seeing him again until The Informant. Oh, he's in The Informant? Nice. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I didn't remember him in that. Who is he in that? He's one of uh, Matt Damon's co-workers. Okay. He might be his yeah. boss, actually. I can see that, yeah. And he's got more gray hair now. I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. Remember that. Well, he was also like, he was a um, traveling musician comedian for a while. He had a song uh, where he sings about like all the questions that people ask him about Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. Don't stop asking me the question. <laughs> and it's great. Like he he definitely embodied the fame that he got from these movies. But I feel like he was probably trying to do more low-key stuff for a while. Um, he was also heavily religious, too, I believe. Oh, so he kind of like, yeah. not that that really has anything to do with his career, but it's, well, I it's wonder. I wonder fact. if he's going to get typecast as a bully <laughs> after a while. And yeah, he, I can... he turned stuff down at first and then was just happy to go on the road for a little while and then just ended up that way. Yeah. Um, he seems well, satisfied with what he's done. So the good thing in each one of the movies is he's both the laughing stock, but he's also intimidating at the same time. Never once do you not believe that he's a threat. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like in the third one, it's definitely like it's the most characterized. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I don't know, it was it was really it was a performance way more than like because Biff when he, when he's playing Biff in the first movie it's just him with like a little bit of old makeup but he's just still being like the same high school bully 
Mm -hmm. But this one, like he had to adapt a whole different persona. A couple of them, because he's the old man in the second one. Obviously, that's not in the third, but he's the Trump-esque version of himself. He is that older bully from the first movie. And then Buford. Ooh. I think Buford's Hold his up. best version. I think uh, you have it backwards. Trump is Biff-esque. Wow. I like at the end of the first movie when he's like the sycophant of George. <laughs> he's like, hey, your novel just came. I would love to see more of that. <laughs> yeah. Of Biff. yeah. But he's like pulling off five different characters in this trilogy and it's yeah. not a one is a sour note. So. The only person who doesn't really get to uh, take on different personas throughout all the movies is Christopher Lloyd. True. He's kind of the same throughout all three. Doc well, Brown. that's why his origin, you never get to know what happened to his parents or the house that burned down. So I'm pretty sure he burned it down for insurance money. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think he's able to fund his experiments? Yeah, but where that's were his parents? That's the real question. I know they, they mentioned he's like a Von Braun or something. That's where they came over from Europe. But they don't go into like, did Seamus have a contemporary Brown? I would like to see him time travel to different continents. That would yeah. be interesting. Do they do that in the animated series at all? Or is it always California? I'm pretty sure they do it. I haven't seen the animated series in 20 years. So, yeah. Um, I believe they go not just in california okay yeah i got the thing is with with that time machine like it doesn't go through space it only goes through time Mm -hmm. right which is why the whole thing with the train at the end of the movie where they have to like you're not thinking fourth dimensionally you know it's it's so it can't they would have to like take the drive the time machine somewhere else Right. In order for that to work. So they kind of probably buzz over that in the animated series. Yeah, of course. Because they're like, kids are going to be watching this. No one cares. Yeah. yeah. Nobody has to worry about, you know, real science. Yeah. Right. But then you have like <laughs> everyone analyzing it now and everyone's talking like all these teeny tiny loopholes. How did Biff, how did old Biff know how to drive the time machine? How did... I know. I'm reading the uh, trivia about all this and someone did the math to figure out how long they actually traveled through the trilogy. And it's like, when Marty comes back to 1985, he's 17 days older than he's supposed to be or something like that. I'm, I'm not getting it exact. And Jennifer is actually two hours younger than when she started. <laughs> so like... See, I love that. Like, I, I used to draw flow charts about like trying to calculate how many time machines were in existence at any given time they do have a point there's like a few minutes at the beginning of this film where there are four deloreans at the same time Mm -hmm. somewhere i forget exactly where it's much more coherent of a timeline than trying to follow the terminator one oh yeah well especially by now you know what's a weird thought i just had just now yeah like i don't know why i just thought this but like um Mm -hmm. In, in physics, like you cannot create nor destroy like uh, energy or matter, mm. but like uh, um, Marty, he comes from the future to the past. Like he brings himself and takes himself back, but like, you know, mm-hmm, yeah. in his lungs, he has oxygen particles. From he, 1885. Yeah. yeah. And then cool. also like if he ate something or drank something and had to, uh, you know, take a dump or piss, he just, he dumped and pissed. He dumped and pissed foreign particles or things that like, so like there's, there's, he pooped 2020 20, or 20, yeah, 20, 2015 uh, drink and didn't he, didn't he eat something in the future? Yeah. So like, <laughs> and then, he, he, and he he's got... also like, like screwed, not, not only with the timeline, but like just like the uh, fabric the of ecosystem, the fabric of time and space and like the universe, period. Like he, in, like there, there's, there's part, like there's particles existing. Like, you know, how, like, you, can't, you can't interact with yourself. Right. Uh, Technically, his shit is back in 18. Yeah, but like that, that shit is going to go into the uh, environment and circulate. What if that shit, like those shit particles, like right down to the very atom, touches another atom, sets off like a chain reaction and like <laughs> destroys the universe? Because like, it, like, it's just a minuscule little particle that all it takes is just like another a- interaction of the same thing. Like they're just from 
two different, like, you know, or he holds it in for two weeks. Yeah, I mean, like, um, or that. <laughs> but, like, God, Jennifer didn't get the memo, though. <laughs> So, so, well, this so there's, a tick, there's a ticking time bomb in this universe. <laughs> like, what if somebody like what Demarcus, if, like, don't steal this idea? Okay. Oh, I oh, hate okay. manure. What if what if like that 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 poo particle like bi like biodegrades goes into a plant and it becomes part of that plant and somebody uh, goes to the grocery store gets a vegetable and that particle is in them now but then they have another part of that, that, that same particle like from that timeline and they're digesting, digesting and then all of a sudden they make that connection and then a big white flash and they, that's the end of so, the time. So time it's the story it. from the manure's <laughs> point of view. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. Uh, okay. This was not a tangent I thought we'd go on. <laughs> oh no, this is I mean, <laughs> right there in my head. I'm like, why have I never thought of that? James it. just just opened a an entirely new branch of and then oh the scatological the timeline. <laughs> the very fact that like uh technically speaking, the you that are that's you now is not really the you that you'll ever be like in any separate like uh, timeline yeah. because like, like your whole body the processes through all these like atoms and uh molecules. And like it, it's like it's constantly breaking down and building itself up. That's like why we right. age and die because like we're just and going we're going through life and like how we change things. every seven years. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So like you're not the same person that you were. Yeah. Uh, despite like you, you know, despite the fact that you're already growing as a person, but like every everything in you right now will not be the same part. Of, won't be part of you years down the line. Yeah. So like uh, those few days or weeks that he's time traveling, he's also shedding. Yeah himself essentially yeah. like his skin uh leaving his dna yeah, everywhere like, pretty much like he's just like he just like he he's like a like a, a european settler come to the new uh new world and just like here you go here's my diseases but now it's wow. it's atoms and yeah, molecules and electrons and protons so like he he i guess he might have set off a time bomb i guess that's why they cover it by having it in a family because then you have his ancestors who have similar dna so that it wouldn't make it too off yeah i don't know but like all right i, 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 I would actually talk to a physicist about this and like what, what like would, would there be like is 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 that just a, like one like, that's like a one in like i don't know a hundred trillion chance or so i don't know the math on this but like what are the chances that the world just gonna end in like and then one of the multiverse yeah. it did i guess um let's get neil degrasse tyson on here yeah so he can debate jimmy well, not about debate shit particles i want to know <laughs> like what, what do i got wrong what is just me and my brain just going wow yeah. all right why don't, why don't we do some final thoughts that was that was an incredible tangent God, i'm sorry it's like i had to, uh, I, had, I had to get it out um just like i'm stamped down in the past <laughs> Um, I was gonna say the box office did all right. Uh, they made 23 million their first weekend, which is admirable enough in 1990. Uh, I got number one. Everything from now on pretty much takes over the box office, the number one film of the week. Um, this opened, and this is why we had uh, Jeff lead us off on May 25th, 1990, which was his second birthday, right? Yeah. Yes, that was my second birthday, which, um, too young also, to understand what's going on. Which also happens to be Bob Gale's birthday. So it came out on his 37th wow. birthday. Or no, 39th. He is, he was 37 when you were born. That's what I, I wrote in my notes. One of my so. favorite things is that I, I, share, I share a birthday with Bob Gale. <laughs> yeah. um, it ended up getting 87.6 total uh, domestic. So it did, it did all right. It's the only one not to cross 100 million but it made its money back for sure because they did the two together and it's i think grown in esteem over the years so i think it did fine but uh you guys have any other thoughts no i'm, I'm gonna spill i'm gonna still be stewing on this for a while what i just you're gonna let it percolate yeah i'm gonna let it uh, i'm just like i'm gonna let it particulate I feel like uh, in the interve in intervening years, it's a movie I've grown to appreciate a lot more 
because mm-hmm. I was it was always the weak link in the trilogy, like I said. But I think it's uh, it's good capstone to the trilogy. And like we were saying, we couldn't really think of any proper ideas for part four. So this ties everything together in a perfect loop. Um, I do like the Western aspect of it too. I, yeah. I think I liked this more and still do than two because I like Westerns, but I kind of think of the two together as one big film, just like they made it. <laughs> yeah, it, it holds up as a Western and a time travel movie. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's, I don't know. I, I've, I used to hate this one because I wasn't a fan of Westerns when I was younger. Um, nor did I like appreciate all the little nuances of, of the timelines and everything. But like, it's actually, uh, I like it better than two now. Um, so it's, I mean, the first one will always be the Holy Grail. Like that's untouchable. But this okay. one is like a very, it's very close uh, in my mind. And just the way that they tied everything together, the way that they told a whole story that didn't necessarily affect everyone's timeline. Like they they kind of actually threw that rule to the wind for a bit. They're like, we're not going to worry too much about fucking up the future timelines right now. And we're just going to try to get them out of this. Um. But yeah, although I, I still like every time I, I cross over train tracks, I'm always wondering if there's going to be those flashes. That's cute. I like yeah. that. Um, so why don't we go into the other films in 1990 or May 1990? Uh, do you want to go through them, Corey, or do you want us to try and do our uh, poster boy first? Let's do Poster Boy first. Sure. Let me see if I can uh, share my screen. There we go. So why don't you uh, describe what is happening in this poster? <clears throat> this is a film that came out in the beginning of the month as compared to the end. So it was still around okay. uh, a little bit, but not really uh, as successful, obviously. All right. All right. All right. All right. So <clears throat> we've got a uh, gentleman hanging upside down uh, next to a skyscraper. Uh, looks like his foot is tangled in some sort of scaffolding. Um, behind him is a helicopter with some dude peeking out, just kind of watching what's going on, making sure this guy's hanging or whatever. Uh, there's <laughs> a clock in the middle of the title. Um, oh, it might give it away. And I don't know, this looks like some sort of. Can you tell who that actor is upside down? I'm getting real Spider Man 2002 vibes from this. I don't know if you know who that is, but do you remember Boardwalk Empire? Dabney Coleman was the, uh, I forget what his name was, but he was kind of like the boss to Steve Buscemi's character. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Atlantic City. Mm. But he was dying, he was on his way out. Yeah. So yeah, Dabney Coleman that, was a like character actor around then. Okay. I'm not, yeah, I can't really. Yeah, you can't really tell here that they can see him. Face. But you can tell uh, from that mustache. Yeah. A man in a mustache. He's Super Mario. So, He's Super Mario Brothers, that's right? Three more years. Uh, right, exactly. One. <laughs> just we'll one guy in a bad situation. <laughs> just one guy, <laughs> right. One guy right, trying to make the best of a bad situation. Okay, so. Do you want the tagline? Uh, sure, give me the tagline. Getting killed isn't as easy as it looks. Okay. Okay. So, I'm <laughs> guessing this movie is about some guy that's trying to get Like, he's got a real good life insurance policy, but he's not, it's, he's like a Leslie Nielsen type character where it's just like, it's, it's almost like Mr. Magoo, but with insurance money. Like he's, he's trying to, 
No, he's trying also, to. I feel like he's also trying to escape the mob. Like that's kind of what this this feels like. Oh, also the helicopter behind him is a police helicopter. So oh, look at that. I never I didn't notice that. Okay, oh, good detail. So I don't know if, if they're if they're like uh, like if they're like chasing a lot of 90s, like a lot of cop movies. Oh, there's cop movies all over there. <laughs> yeah, that got big in the eighties and nineties, probably because of like Die Hard and Oh yeah, true. I mean they're it's always around French connection. So. Yeah. I feel like this is like a spoof of Die Hard. Like if he's I didn't mean to bring you down that lane. <laughs> no, no, that's that's fine. Uh how how was he doing? Because I don't know exactly what this is about. Uh, the life the life insurance policy is right on the money. That's all I knew about it. Okay. Um, but is is he one of the police or the police chasing him? He's one of the police. Know. Oh, he okay. is. Okay. I didn't know that. All right. So he's an undercover cop trying to get life insurance money, but he can't. He's too good at his job, so he can't get killed. I don't know. He's not, he's not too far off. So should I? You want to guess uh, the title? Yeah, let's try to guess the title. Uh, time to kill. Time to die. <laughs> time to kill. This is the John Grisham uh, early almost, version. Right. Uh, <clears throat> almost. No, not, not quite dead. I don't know. Um, hang on. <laughs> Think about that clock. Hanging by a moment. I know, I'm thinking of the clock. High noon. Thin blue line. Um, yeah. Errol Morris. High, high noon. The clock but, could be representing a certain letter that I didn't think about when I fuzzed out the name. Uh, 1230. Uh, okay, so it's... So maybe it's an O. Uh, <laughs> cop time <laughs> oh, I got one of the words <laughs> overtime um, not bad guess there. Yeah. Yeah, overtime isn't that bad a name yeah all right I'm oh here we go and go when I try there we go short time oh yep because you're short on time and the reason okay. I fuzzed at the top, it gives you the plot. And I think you've guessed enough with the, uh, you pretty much got the insurance issue. Okay. Yeah. But it gives it all away on the poster. Yeah. Detective so, Bert Simpson thinks he's getting, Bert Simpson. <laughs> <That's> yep. Really? <laughs> Detective yep. Bert Simpson thinks he's got two weeks to live. But if he can get killed in the line of duty, his family will be set for life. Thank God. Funny I didn't realize he was a cop because I didn't read that as I was erasing it. Um, so how close was he, Corey? I mean, he got the life insurance part and he actually, I wouldn't even have picked out that that was a police helicopter, but you can see it says police between his legs. But um, yeah, Dabney Coleman plays a police officer. He's given a diagnosis of having two weeks left to live. I forget. It might be a brain thing. I forget exactly, but um his son is still pretty young so they want to have enough money for him to go to college eventually so he thinks this life insurance policy will maybe be able to subsidize that but his pension's not going to cover it he's about to retire so he's got to get killed in the line of duty in order to fund that okay yeah so um, that. i mean it the movie itself is <laughs> pretty saccharine not that funny but it has some oh. really amazing car stunts okay so if you're going to a movie like this for the second unit stuff then you'll be happy but aside from that it's pretty forgettable yeah i wonder if it's on anything right now it um sounds like it's worthwhile at least but i don't know good job jeff that's i'd say you have two of five so far i'm gonna give this one to you yeah, thanks, man. Uh, also, so wait, why do I see Michael Bolton's name in the credits? How was it? Let me look myself. That's a guy from Office he... Space. Is it? It's not oh, the same. Oh, you didn't Michael. notice. The other actors are uh, Matt Frewer, who was the um, Max Headroom. Max, Max Headroom, yeah. yeah. Terry Gar, 
Barry Corbin, and Joe Pantoliano. Joey Pants. Yeah. It says executive producer Michael Bolton. I think it's a different one. Yeah, it's a different one. No, I'm just going to head kind of like Michael Bolton, the musician, was an executive producer on this movie. <laughs> I'm going to look that up as you start to discuss the other films. Okay. Um, well, some of the other movies that came out this month were uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, which is a spinoff of a uh, anthology series started by George A. Romero. And it's got uh, three interconnecting stories, one of which is actually written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, yeah. about, a, about a mummy that's resurrected. Yeah. Actually, People might know because it was kind of a launch pad for a lot of recognizable stars now. Christian Slater's in it. Um, Steve Buscemi's in it. Julianne Moore. And that's just in the Mummy segment. In some of the other segments, there's uh, James Remar, who you and I met. And um, that's your dad. Debbie Harry. Uh, Ray Don Chong, who's in another movie this month. Might as well jump to that. Uh, Far Out Man which was the directorial oh. debut of Tommy Chong and probably one of the worst comedies I've ever seen in my entire life. Oof. That's saying a lot. Yeah. It's a uh, pure nepotism. It has Ray Dawn, which is his daughter, his wife, his son. He's in it. Uh, Cheech has a cameo. And I couldn't really tell you the plot because there's not much of one but that he's playing basically the same alter ego that he plays in all the Cheech and Chong movies, which is an aging hippie. And he goes on a cross country journey. Hmm. And the extent of the jokes are Martin Mull plays a doctor named Little Dick. And so he yeah. constantly is mispronouncing it. And that's one of the jokes in the movie. We'll move on. Yeah. Uh, there's this movie called The Big Bang, which is a documentary by James Tobeck, where he's uh, he interviews people from all walks of life, getting their philosophies on life, death, love, sex. Um, it's pretty good. It's uh, it almost kind of reminds me of like some of the more experimental like Link Later movies, like Waking Life and stuff like that. It's not bad. I recently re watched it for this specifically, but uh, it's pretty good. He got a little notorious well that's later in the decade we're talking about when he had a clean slate right now Maybe. <clears throat> um and a sequel to a uh, michael j fox film uh class of 1999 which is a sequel to class of 1984 uh there's really no connective plot tissue between the two except that they're both directed by mark l lester and they're both set in schools this one is set in a school that's being reconnoitered by these uh, cyborg teachers oh god what? and it it sounds really schlocky and it should be fun but it's actually kind of a drag um the teachers actually are uh played by pam greer stacy keach and robert ryan so uh, <laughs> there's a <clears throat> bird on the wire which is a uh, action comedy romance with Mel Gibson and Goldie Hawn directed by uh, John Baden and it's got some really offensive homosexual stereotypes in it the action's pretty lackluster the comedy's lame it's probably one of the worst Mel Gibson movies this month isn't very good we, uh, I'm just letting people know that we mentioned, we mentioned this earlier in our uh, series because it took over the number one spot from I think Pretty Woman, or I think Pretty Woman, maybe TMNT. I don't remember. Yeah, it was the one from the beginning of May that kind of ends that run of the three big ones from March. It's aggressively mediocre. Um, then we have uh, Cadillac Man, which I remember watching a lot when I was a kid. Uh, it's actually Robin Williams plays this uh, car salesman who ends up in a hostage situation with Tim Robbins and all of his um, philandering comes to fruition as this uh hostage situation is playing out it's it's not great in terms of Robin Williams vehicles it's on the lesser end like with sur the survivors and stuff like that mm -hmm. we uh, this as well because uh Judith Haig was filming this at the same time she was doing Turtles 
Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then we have By Dawn's Early Light, which is actually an HBO original movie. It has a pretty good concept. I've never seen it, but it's about uh, what could have been a World War III after the end of the Cold War. And actually has a pretty good cast. It's got James Earl Jones and Powers Booth and some other people. So I might eventually end up checking that out. And then uh, yeah, Firebirds, cool. which is a uh, kind of a Top Gun knockoff with my favorite actor, Nicolas Cage and Tommy Lee Jones. And the love interest is Sean Young. Oh. But, uh, it's very jingoistic. I did not see this. I meant to watch this before the podcast, um, but from what I can gather from the reviews, it was not well regarded at all. Yeah, I'm curious about it now because I hear it's harder to find now. That's why we never really hear about it because it kind of. I think it recently just got a Blu-ray release, but okay. It's in terms of movies from that era, in terms of Nicolas Cage, like Birdie and stuff like that, were got more positive reviews and are more widely known. Mm -hmm. Do we want to uh, go through picks of the month? Do we have anything in this month? Sure. I uh, I saw Borat's subsequent movie film. And oh boy. Uh, it's not as fresh as the first one. Obviously, how could it be? Because at this point, even within the plot of the movie, Borat has to go under disguise because that movie was a huge sleeper hit at the time and everybody knows that character by now. But mm -hmm. uh, it does have some genuinely jaw-dropping moments towards the last 10 minutes. And it's funny throughout. I'm not just saying that you have to wait. There's not like a drought of laughs. But uh, for a belated sequel, a belated comedy sequel, it's pretty good. Hmm. Maybe I will actually check it out then. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't hearing some tepid reviews so. uh, um i actually had checked out a couple films from a uh, local film festivals because i i went the last few years to the montclair film festival so i felt like i should get a couple virtually this year and it was actually kind of easy to access so i got um minari which was the big winner at sundance but i also just decided to check out a couple smaller films that i probably never would have otherwise and the best of the ones I got was this film called White Lie, where this girl who's in school um, has a GoFundMe to help pay for her cancer treatment. And we pretty quickly learn that she's definitely faking it. And she's starting to spiral with all the lies she's developed. And she has to like come up with pills that she's taking. And then eventually she's trying to get a scholarship somewhere. And the bursar needs her to prove she has cancer, so she needs the medical records and she has to fabricate them and everything just starts to spiral out of control. And it's a pretty Canadian uh, film. It's this newcomer that's uh, just immediately captivating in how she can manipulate you to feel bad for her despite her being or doing something so terrible. So it's I'd definitely say to check it out. It's, it's probably harder to find because it's all these films coming out this year not really coming out after they're in festivals so hopefully it'll find a way to get on vod soon but uh, hey, Jimmy. oh yeah no like uh i don't know what just started watching uh uh what we do in the dark what we do in the shadows oh what we do in the shadows well i i yeah. always screw up that title i don't know why uh this uh tv series yeah yeah based have on you the seen movie, the movie on... oh yeah no i love the movie we do. the movie's oh. great i fantastic it's like uh it's like um and like sometimes i'm not too uh fond of um tv show adaptations of uh, decent movies because sometimes they're just like, kind of they're just um poor imitations but this one ratchet you know, this one's, yeah this one's a uh, this one's hitting its mark like uh yeah these characters like the vampires are very like similar and like because of the comedy uh, to the original characters from the movies, but they, they have, seem to have their own distinct, like, you know, characteristics. I actually uh, appreciate that. When it was announced, I was kind of like, I would have rather seen Jermaine Clement, especially him having done so well with Flight of the Concords, but him producing it, they have the same style, it's just different people. Yeah. But now they're in Staten Island instead of wherever they were before. New Zealand. Yeah, so, so 
Yeah, now it's like uh, it's they're they're as characters they're familiar, but like they're their own thing and they have their own interaction. And I think that's like that's a key thing, like that uh, that like they're not repeating the uh, the uh, the dynamic between the characters. Yeah. Because uh, like no matter what, like uh, you're in, in in movies and television, like uh, you're always reinventing the wheel, and like the there's only so much you could do with the wheel. So what what you have to do to make it like interesting and dynamic is how the characters interact with each other yeah so that's uh, a credit to the actors yeah so so this they're is, originally uh, gonna do a uh, movie sequel about the werewolves which yeah. i would have loved the, the third episode covers them a bit so they'll be uh, interacting i think or interacting. is reese darby in it no because obviously it's in a different location but ah. i I feel like I heard something about maybe some of these characters could show up if they haven't already in the first two seasons. We've only watched the first few, so right. we'll see. I know there's some big cameos towards the end of the season that aren't those people, but we'll see. Right. Uh, um, I've been watching Halt and Catch Fire. Oh. On, which was an AMC series uh, following this uh, fictional software company that's trying to cash in on the, um, the PC market in the 80s, uh, going up against Apple and um, Xerox and all them. So it's, uh, it's a drama. Uh, it's really good. I'm into season two or three now. Um, but it's it's very well done. Uh, the characters are all really good, um, and it's it's got some. It's interesting to see like how they interact with the uh, the actual companies of the day. Um, so it's definitely worth a watch. Is it kind of like Mad like, Men? In what's that? Is it kind of like Mad Men in the eighties? Yeah, basically, it's like Mad Men, but with computers in the 80s. Cool. It's, it's pretty much the same, same type. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, we'd like to thank you for listening to our uh, discussion of Back to the Future Part 3. Uh, all, of our, all of us would agree that it's probably one of the easiest trilogies to name as one of the best. I don't know why I said it that way, but uh, the um, next month we're probably going to do uh, a comic book adaptation again, uh, technically a comic, uh, Dick Tracy. And uh, we might talk about a few other films that were pretty big that month because this is the start of the summer season. So uh, blockbusters were getting to control the market. So. Um, Hopefully you tune in next time. And uh, again, thanks for listening. Remember to uh, rate and subscribe. Um, check out both the video if you're listening to the podcast or listen again if you've already watched the video. Uh, you can follow us all on Twitter at different places. I'm at Interjected. Uh, this is at Podcast Jections. All right. Hopefully you've uh, enjoyed what we've been doing continue on this undiscovered decade. Okay, all right. Because I think Slipknot all the time. <laughs>